the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or as high as the sky. But Ahaz answered, I will not ask. I will not tempt the Lord. Then he said, Listen, house of David, is it not enough that you weary human beings? Must you also weary my God? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The young woman, pregnant, and about to bear a son, shall name him Emmanuel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Since you have purified yourselves by obedience to the truth for sincere mutual <laughs> love, love one another intensely from a pure heart. You have been born anew, not from perishable, but from imperishable seed, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower wilts, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And, and with your spirit. spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at what he said and pondered what sort of reading this might be. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold, you conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? The angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived this son in her old age, and this is her sixth month. For her, for her who is called barren, for nothing is impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, may it be done unto me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of our Lord. <coughs> Praise to you, Lord. Sweet surrender. You know, easier said than done. That in the course of events, the Blessed Mother had loved God from the beginning of her. The fact that she become aware of life and existence, she become aware of God. Because the greeting of the angel tells us something. Hail, full of grace. She was unique, filled with grace. She was special in God's eyes. And for a good reason, she was the handmaid of the Lord, as she said. Now, that was a loaded question. Just listen to the dialogue. Here she is, quietly saying her prayers, and out of the blue comes Gabriel. And for the grace of the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Oh, what's this all about? <laughs> you found favor with my father. You're going to be a mother. You're going to have a son. You're going to name him Jesus all in one breath. <laughs> How can this be? I don't have a husband. I have no relations with a man. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The child that you'll bear will be the Son of God. Well, 
This is the test. What did she say? Yay? Well, let me talk it over with Joseph. <laughs> Think about it. Go back to Abraham. Remember Abraham? Left Ur, left civilization, left Palm Springs, didn't want to do nothing. And he was promised to have numerous uh, children as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand and the sea. And Sarah had one son named Isaac. What does God do? Puts, her, puts him to the test. Who does Abraham love more? <coughs> Me or the son I gave him? Think about it. What did Jesus say to us in Scripture? Pray that you not be put to the test. Remember, he was tested often in the desert. He was tempted. How did he respond? How did Mother Mary respond? I am the hand of the Lord. Just like Abraham. What did, Ab what did Isaac say to Abraham as he's walking up and he's carrying the wood for the sacrifice? Daddy, where's the, where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? He said, God will provide. That's what you call total, absolute trust. Now, did Abraham understand how it would work out? I think he just knew he could trust God. And what did God want to know from Abraham? <coughs> did he have that trust? But I think Abraham, God already knew that before he asked. So maybe he asked the question of Abraham, so Abraham knew always that he put God first in his life. <coughs> think about that. Mother Mary, she was asked, without hesitation, she said, be it done unto me according to your word. I am the handmaid of the Lord. I am your humble servant. In life, we are going to have tests. I've had tests. I'm sure you have too. I was tested many times, whether to persevere in my vocation. And one of the best things that happened to me, next, of course, to WCF, <laughs> was Curcio. That was at a time of my life when I was not saying my prayers, I was lukewarm. And I was restless. And yet, that was what brought me back to the realization of the joy that comes from serving God. What touched me was to see the people, like yourselves, at this weekend. Here you had plumbers giving royals talks, and you had priests working in the kitchen. It was the whole of society turned upside down. Doctors were doing menial work, and servants were giving excellent talks. And I thought, wow. And this something, what the early church must have been like. And it renewed my faith. It was a shot in the arm. And I worked with Tercy U for 12 years, giving talks and being part of the Forte program. But now I'm in the Forte program. WCF is part of it and working for Food for the Poor. So each of us will have tests. But the important thing is you can be assured you will answer yes if you have a relationship with God. Mother Mary didn't get it after the fact. She had it before the question was asked. Abraham didn't get it after the test. He was tested because he had it. Anyone, if you look in the whole of salvation history, Old Testament or New, even the song, Here I Am, Lord, was a response to a call from God. We may be called to different things at different times. How we will answer depends on our relationship with God. Today, tomorrow, and Sunday is a chance for us, each one, to deepen that relationship. Each one of us, God has something special. It's not by accident you're here, nor am I here. But for what purpose, God will reveal. Amen. <laughs>
uh, throughout the day. And uh, with the word fear, fear, a lot of people have, have fear. I have fear of losing my hair. It's <laughs> <laughs> happening all the time. I got this Rogaine, but it doesn't taste <laughs> Fear is an acronym. An acronym which sounds for what? Fear of uh, future oh, events appearing real. Future events appearing real. So, in many cases, those things have dominated our lives. Any uh, unforgiveness, and again, to release them to the Lord into the fullness of God's mercy. St. Faustina was told, My mercy is an ocean. Immerse yourself in it. So, let us, you know, avail of that ocean and immerse ourselves in it at this time of releasing to the Lord. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. And yet it was our pain that he bore, our sufferings he endured. We thought of him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our sins crushed for our iniquity. He bore the punishment that makes us whole. By his wounds, we are, were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, all following our own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of Peter. For Christ also suffered for sins once, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that he might lead you to God. Put to death in the flesh, he was brought to life in the spirit. In it he also went to preach to the spirits in prison, who had once been disobedient, while God patiently waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few persons, eight in all, were saved through the water. This prefigured baptism, which saves you now, it is not a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory Glory to the Lord. Lord. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave, it, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. The Gospel of the Lord. Tonight, the focus is on the passionate love of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to break this into two parts. And I want you to identify with one scripture or another scripture or even a saint that has personified this, uh, this type of uh, awareness that Jesus had. It's called the compassion. And the compassion is to suffer with the passion. Not so much suffer with the passion, but to identify with it like a force. A passion has energy. It has life. Okay? We speak about passionate people. People are... We'll see a lot of passion tomorrow in the Super Bowl. <laughs> and when it's over, we'll see a lot of compassion. <laughs> but compassion is having the passion with us. And there's one scripture that, you know, uh, Jesus looked on the crowd and he had compassion on them. For they were like sheep without a shepherd. It's that sense of the heart of Jesus Christ. When you think of the life of Jesus, the three short years that he had, one of the miracles is that he survived so long. Mm -hmm. They should have gotten rid of him much earlier. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? Because he contradicted 
every, everything with his love. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But what I say to you is, pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you and persecute you. Be good to them. You know, forgive them. That whole sense of uh, compassion that Jesus had. Lord, if you will to do so, you can make us clean. I do will it be made clean. Compassion on the lepers who were basically under the threat of death. Condemnation. There was no cure for it. You know. And he had compassion upon them. Okay? Mary Magdalene, you know, about to be stoned to death. Has anyone condemned you? No one, sir, she said, nor do I go and sin no more. And he had a life partner in Mary Magdalene, the first one to whom the resurrection was revealed. The man at the pool of Bethsaida, no one will put me into the pool, and Jesus healed him. We have many images of that compassion of Jesus. I am the good shepherd, my sheep know me and follow me. We have it, you know, many, many times that are uh, you know, and one of the mistakes that Jesus made of curing Peter's mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> that was the sense that we have of the, you know, and when you look upon it, you know, how many times they were looking for him. They came to him, all those who had diseases and were blind and, and all of that. It was the heart of Jesus Christ. And we have images of that. The prodigal son, the father, who should not have gone out to meet that son if he had been a good Jewish father. He would have said, kid, you pay back every penny. Mm -hmm. You know, the compassion that Jesus had, you know, are you upset because I'm generous? I pay my workers, I take care of them. You know, all of those images that flash to us from the gospel, from the gospel, and the scribes and the Pharisees at Nazareth, were trying to lay their hands on him. And he walked through their midst because his time had not yet come. And we have images of all of those things. The widow at Nain, okay, her only son dead and was restored to life. The centurion, his child or his servant, you know, healed. Those are pictures of what's in the heart of Jesus Christ. The love that he has for us and look at our own lives and see if we can identify times like that. Tough times that, that we had. You know, I remember when my father died and I didn't know anything about it because he'd been sick for three years. He'd been sick for three years. He didn't want me to know. He didn't want me to know. Any decision he makes, he makes it on his own, not because of me. And I remember feeling so desperate at the time, like, why? Here I am giving my life to God, and God won't even spare my father. Mm -hmm. Won't even spare my father. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> it's called anger. It's called anger, and it's, it's an anger that is, that's piercing. Yeah. It's not an anger that you get over, you know, because someone cuts in front of you with traffic. It's an anger that lasts. And that does damage. Mm -hmm. It separates you from the love of Jesus Christ. St. Paul asks, I think it was Corinthians, can anything separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is yes, we can do it ourselves. Very, very readily. And then when we look at the passionate love of Jesus, some years ago, you remember the movie quite well, um, I mean, the passion of the Christ. And they said, you know, I remember uh, the provincial on the East Coast, because I was the provincial on the West Coast, and he said, they overdid it. They overdid the scourging at the pillar. Okay. It was too much. And there's, nobody could endure that. And I said, you're right. Nobody could endure that unless they had love, unless they were consumed by love. And that is no greater love as anyone. Jesus had that love all the time. And we hear it, you know, from the, from the cross. We hear it in the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. Some of them you may know, some of them you may not know. One of the first ones from the cross, 
I thirst. St. Bridget of Sweden, who wrote the 15 prayers. She lived in the 14th century, 1302. She was born. Okay. She never spoke until she was three, which delighted her parents to know it. <laughs> but when she started speaking, she never shut up. <laughs> she had tremendous awareness of Jesus. And one day she had a dream. And she saw Jesus covered in blood, suffering, nailed to the cross. And she said, Lord, why? Why are you going through this? He says, because of the ingratitude, the sinfulness of, of men, sinfulness of human beings. She got married at the age of 15. Okay? And she had eight children, one of which was a saint. St. Catherine of Sweden. Can you imagine? Don't go say anything to your sister. She's going to be a saint. <laughs> <laughs> and she wrote the 15 prayers on the, on the Passion of the Christ. Tremendous prayers that are, that are said. I say them on a daily basis. First word from the cross, I thirst. I thirst for the salvation of the human race. Wasn't so much, you know... Uh, even though it was like a physical thirst, but it was a spiritual thirst. I thirst for the salvation of the human race. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Same prayer that St. Stephen, the first martyr, uttered. Father, forgive them. And he meant it genuinely. Father, forgive them. Okay? Because of what they do. They do not know. And in many cases, I think it's in Luke's Gospel, you know, there's a lot going on in Women's Christian Fellowship. An awful lot of the movement of the Spirit of God. Some of it is suffering, some of it is pain, but some of it is the anointing, the blessing, the healing, the fellowship, the community, you know, the linking with Christ that Jesus is appearing again and again and again in the life of women. Okay? In, in, the life, in your lives, as you belong to this you know, a community of Women's Christian Fellowship over the years. And it doesn't happen in just one session. It doesn't happen. It happens, it unfolds. How God is so gentle with you. You know, how God is gentle with you and allows his love, allows that passion that he had that brought him to the cross that said, I thirst. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. Maybe it is. <laughs> it's about the Lord and us. What the Lord is doing in our lives. How powerful it is. And sometimes, about three or four, about five years ago now, I had cataracts. And I had a little magnifying glass to, to look at the words. I used to do the crossword puzzle. And I'd have the magnifying glass to do it. And then I had cataracts from... <coughs> wow! <laughs> wow! I better clean up my room, it looks terrible. <laughs> you see, and that's the insight that Jesus gives us. Why didn't I see it before now? What was in the way? Think of the passion of Jesus. Father, forgive them. Okay? This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. The other thief had all the right reason. You know, we're just criminals. You know. I'm teed off, I'm dying here. No, but can anybody hear me? Anybody hear me? And then the other thief, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Identified nails Jesus. You say that you know me, but you do not know me. How true it is of us. You come to Women's Christian Fellowship, you get to know him. To really know him. Not only with the head, but with the heart. No, no one should ever steal that from you. We have all sorts of reasons in our church why people drift away, why people get involved in, in other things. We have a home for unwed mothers, and we have a bunch of uh, women there, and they go to the rock. The rock. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Uh, and again, why do you go there? Well, they have nice music there. They have nice music there. But your heart is broken. You've been hurt in life. You're not only the woman at the well, but you're the woman at many wells. 
And God has healed you. He's brought you here. He's brought you here. We had uh, last um, November, I'm digressing a little bit. Um, we're always looking for money. <laughs> and we had this guy come from uh, San Manuel, you know, Indian band, the casino. And he came down and he was going to Mary's table where we feed the poor. So he brought him to Veronica's home. He said, wow, I didn't even know this place existed. So we bring them around and the whole thing. We brought them up to the computer room where they get their GED which is getting more difficult, by the way, to get. And Libby was in there. Libby's a gal been with us. And she said, Father, I'm leaving you in December. And I said, oh, well, we're going to miss you, Libby. And she said, uh, well, I have, she said, you know, I came to this home three years ago. She said, and I had issues. I had drug problems. There was a straining order against me. I didn't have my, my child. She says, I had no education. She says, now I'm leaving, she said. I have my GED, I have my child back, I don't have a drug problem anymore. And she said, you know how this happened? And the guy from San Manuel said, how, how did it happen? She says, because this place is built on love. Oh, wow. Give me the money back. <laughs> quite often, and when you see, you know, the stuff and the crap that some of these women have gone through in life, and to see them turn around, to see them taking care of children, they no longer cuss at the children, you know, they hold them, and there's so many people to hold them, and one of the best people that goes over there is me. <laughs> Why? Because I'm the only man they see. You know? I used to lift weights, but now I I think we don't have, we can't comprehend how great the passion of Jesus Christ is for us. How powerful it is if we'd only let it in. If we let ourselves be loved. We can love other people, but can we allow that the one who has no reservations against us, the one who has gone to the cross, the one who said, son behold your mother, mother behold your son. You know, the last breath that he had is always giving us something, is giving us something. The gospel we wrote tonight, we read tonight, before he died. There's no more he could give us. The reality is that Jesus can't do any more for us. The truth is that what he's done for us, you know, is miraculous. It's beyond our comprehension. But it says, you know, as you were picked up as a baby, you were held and loved. That's infinite. That goes on for eternity, even though you're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. That's still you're held in the arms of the Father. Abba. Abba, Father. And again, remember that? Uh, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All that he did, and yet he has that sense of depression. <coughs> Despair. Despair. He's human though. He should have that. But the father consoled him at the baptism. The father consoled him on Tabor. Where was the father now? Now he needed consolation. It takes passion to get through that. It takes a fire within. A fire that is there all the time. You have that fire. Otherwise you wouldn't be on this mountaintop. Mm -hmm. You have that fire, and you come each, each year to renew that fire. And that fire is renewed so many times. I was at uh, the meeting last uh, Thursday, and some of the sharings there, you know, were better than anything I could ever preach. They came from the heart. 
And when they come from the heart, you just have to bow down in front of them and say, you know, how great is our God? How great is our God? And then the final word from the cross. It is consummated. It's a victory shout. I've done it. Hey, Dad, I've got it done. We got the plan done. The plan has come into fulfillment. When we talk about the passion of Christ, we look at the seven last words. Fulton Sheen was so impressed with those words that he spoke about them really as the fulfillment of the love in the heart of God. And we see it, and we need to see it as it unfolds in the gospel before the passion ever happened. It unfolded because, you know, Jesus is, is as St. John says, Jesus is love. And that's, that's the bottom line, the foundation. And that love is in our lives. But we can have, you know, fear of, you know, past sins, things that have happened many years ago, things that we still carry, you know, rather than, you know, the mercy of God. Go your way, your sins are forgiven. Go your way, sin no more. How were they able to do that? How was Augustine able to walk away from relationships that were passionate? <laughs> There's no doubt. <laughs> but he walked away from them and became the saint. How was St. Francis able to walk away from his own father and found one of the strongest orders? Sorry, Father Bill. <laughs> In the church. Changed the church completely. Changed the church, you know, completely. And we see it in many, and we see it in your lives. But get your cataracts removed. See it for yourself. See what the passion of Jesus Christ is doing for you. It's ongoing. You can't stop it. You can't stop Jesus. You can't stop yourself. You can't stop yourself. St. Teresa, who had a tremendous insight, decided she would make an act of oblation to God. 1894, offered all my thoughts, words, deeds, actions, past, present, future, to you, the Sacred Heart of Jesus. She lived in depression for the next three years of her life. Where are you, God? I can't find you. I used to be able to find you. You moved, you know, in that sense. But she was faithful. She knew Jesus. And it's in the darkest time, as the psalm says, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are there. And sometimes we're looking for feelings, and no feelings come. And yet, God is ever present. God is ever present. Think about the death of my own father, how much my father means to me now, more so in death than in life. How did that happen? How did that happen? You know, so the consolation is always there if we can see what the heart of Jesus is for us, how strong that love is for us. It's passion, passion without a doubt, passion that brought him to the cross, the compassion that he gives us. So think of it tonight as we offer the Mass, as we're aware of God's healing touch. You know, don't limit the Lord's healing in any way. God knows what has to be healed, and sometimes we're the ones who stand in his way. You know, rather than begin to see, here I am, Lord. Here I am. I'm open to you. you know, whatever you want to do, however you're going to heal it, you know, and be patient. You know, be patient. Sometimes, you know, you're sinned more against than you sin. Think of it in that way. Why is that? Because we have free ways. That's why. <laughs> but you have family. You have people in the family who get upset with you. You know, people who judge you. People who say things, hurtful things to you. Hurtful things to you. And, uh, you know, it, and I, I know a family where uh, this uh, man was there and he was in a car crash with his wife. And uh, his sister was in the car. 
and uh, they were all safe, thanks to the God. But there was uh, the sister decided she would sue her brother, and she sued her brother and got some money out of it. And then a few years ago, she died. And he said, well, good riddance, it's about time for her to go. <laughs> Brother, sister. They're in the same home, same family. So there's a lot. But the love of Christ overcomes all of that. So think of passion, compassion, which scene in the gospel most touches you? Which saint that you know, you know most exemplifies that? So again, a sort of a an element to motivate you, to sort of give you a sense of, of God's presence and the redeeming power of his love on the cross. A reading from the prophet Malachi. <laughs> now I am sending my messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will come suddenly to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire. See, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand firm when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire, like fuller's lie. He will sit refining and purifying silver, and he will purify the Levites refining them like gold or silver, that they may bring offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord, as in ancient days, as in years gone by. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Now since the children share in blood and flesh, he likewise shared in them that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who through fear of death had been subject to slavery all their life. Surely he did not help angels, but rather the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers in every way, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest before God, to expiate the sins of the people, because he himself was tested through what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. The word of the Lord. Praise be God. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. When the days were completed for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord and to offer sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, in accordance with the dictate in the law of the Lord. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The man was righteous and devout, awaiting the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Messiah of the Lord. He came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform the custom of the law in regard to him, he took him into his arms and blessed God, saying, Now, Master, you may let your servant go in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Mm -hmm. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for all, for the fall 
and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be contradicted, and you yourself a sword shall will pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived seven years with her husband after her marriage, and then as a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day with fasting and prayer, and coming forward at that very time, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were awaiting the redemption of Israel. When they had fulfilled all the prescriptions of the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of the Lord. Right, what a way to finish our weekend together here on the mountaintop. We finish with this beautiful story and the presentation of our Lord in the temple. And we're told that uh, there was a time of purification. Uh, in those days, as in today's time, those people had a very, they were, people of that day as today were very conflicted about the role of sexual activity in their lives. And so when a woman would become pregnant uh, and would give birth, they wondered about the sexual act that she had engaged in to have this child. Now, this is the point. They knew in those days, as we do today, that to have a child, to give birth to a child, was to participate in a very, very sacred activity. Giving birth to new life, to children, was seen as a sacred act, and they respected that. And yet they felt conflicted about having sexual relations because they knew its purpose, fundamentally, was procreation, but they also knew that they enjoyed it, and that there was pleasure involved in this act. And so many times people were conflicted about their own sexuality. And so when they had children, they felt that it was important to have a time of purification in case their intentions were not pure in the generation of a child. And so there were all kinds of purification rules at that time. And the one adopted by the Jewish people was to have about 40 days for a child, 66 days for or a girl, I think 40 days for, for a boy, to give the woman and the couple a time um, of abstinence, and of purification, and to give the woman a break, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, even though we know that Mary did not engage in sexual activity, uh, she went along with the practice and respected this purification practice. And so her time, or their time of purification of 40 days, was complete. Now that fits in beautifully with our retreat because this whole retreat has been talking about cleansing and purification and preparation. And so, in a sense, Mary and Joseph become a symbol for what has been happening with us over this weekend. And then, once their time of purification was over, they offered a sacrifice for their child. Now this goes back to all the, it was a Jewish rule, that all the firstborn children, parents had to offer a sacrifice for them. And this goes back to the Old Testament. You remember the tenth plague, when Moses said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, sure, and then changed his mind, and over and over, well, it came to the tenth plague, when, um, the Lord took the firstborn males and females of everybody and of everything. This act <clears throat> had a profound effect on the Jewish people. The Jewish firstborn were not touched, but everybody else's were taken. And so they felt that the firstborn belonged to God. Even though they received the firstborn, they felt that it belonged to God. And so, because the firstborn belonged to God, there was a ritual whereby the couple could buy the child back. 
they would redeem their child. And so every couple would bring their firstborn, male and female, to the temple or to a synagogue, whatever they could do, offer the child to the Lord, and then offer a sacrifice to redeem the child so they could take the child home and raise them as their own. Now, if you were wealthy, you could have formed a lamb, and you would offer up a lamb in sacrifice. And if you were poor, you would offer up a couple of turtle doves or a couple of birds. That's all you could afford. And that's what Mary and Joseph did. They brought their child to the temple, and they bought him back by offering a sacrifice of two turtle doves. So what does that have to do with us today? <laughs> what, what does this presentation in the temple have to do with us? Well, the presentation is a symbol of our Mass. It's a symbol of our liturgy. When we started Mass, well, at least in, well, we, we will have in a moment the procession of the gifts, in which case we will bring simple gifts of bread and wine to the altar. And that will be part of our sacrifice. We will also bring something else to the altar today. We have them here on the floor. Which is really heavy. <laughs> Ten pounds. Very, very heavy. All of your personal needs and intentions and your personal sacrifices. Plus there's another box down there with more in them. And so we bring these up to the altar as well. So we bring up all of your sacrifices, all of your suffering, all of your trials, everything that you've been going through, the sleepless nights, the worries, the prayers, the hopes, the disappointments in life. We bring them up and we place them on the altar with our simple gifts of bread and wine. And then the Lord gives us Jesus, just like he gave to, the, to Mary and Joseph. Jesus is given back to us. And we believe and we know that the bread and the wine is changed and transformed into the body and blood of Christ, which we will receive after, uh, after uh, the consecration is over. This beautiful gift of Christ we receive into our hearts, and he will dwell in our souls. Now, many of the mystics in the church have said that the entire purpose, the whole purpose of the Incarnation, you know, the, the birth of the Son of God into the world, His teaching, His miracles, His suffering and His passion and resurrection, all of that was given to us so that we could receive Christ and receive the beautiful gifts that He has to give us right after we receive Him. As a matter of fact, many of the saints have said that the most important time, the most important time of our lives, the one time that Jesus has come, is for the moment after we receive him. Because once we receive him in the Eucharist, he comes into our hearts, body and soul, divinity. He also brings with him the Holy Spirit and the Father, and all of them dwell within us. And they open and give their gifts to us. And so today, as we continue with the Mass, let us remember, and remember this wonderful gift that we're about to receive. Jesus Christ, under the, under the appearances of bread and wine, into our heart. And remember that that moment, after we receive him, is the moment when he has all his gifts to give to you. So, let us prepare for that moment of receiving Christ and prepare for that moment after we, we receive him in the Eucharist so that we can bring the beautiful gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit that he has to give us back into the lives that we Before you, and the eyes of all men will be fixed on the light. 
mercy and justice, you'll 